So <coughs> let me first introduce myself and where I come from as soon as this works. I'm from the Zurich University of Applied Sciences in Winterthur and uh, I work in the Institute of Applied Information Systems. So basically it's computer science, a little bit more longer title and I'm associated with the data lab which we recently founded to bring together people who are interested in data analytics from different types of um, competences like statistics and business and computer science of course. My name is Mark Zillibach. Um, I'm here a little bit at home because I did my PhD here some 10 years ago. Then I went to some small company basically um, which worked in the area of social media monitoring. I see that two people at least are here who work for this company as well. Sorry, three? Oh, he used to work there as well. Sorry, I forgot. I brought him into this company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <coughs> Martin, sorry. <laughs> um, so, three at least. Um, there was a fourth one who didn't show up yet, I think. Leo? Okay. Um, and in this area, I became also interested in the field of text analytics because we did some social media monitoring. We wanted to know what people are going to write in the internet and we wanted to extract information in some way. So, what is text analytics? I brought some examples what we are working on. Well, not, we are not working on every project which is shown here. But typically, you want to, you have given a text or a lot of text and you want to extract some information from the text. And something like you want to have a summary from the text, you want to know what is in there without reading the entire text. And, or you, you want to predict what someone is typing on a smartphone to, to do some spell checking. Uh, you want to translate text. Um, you want to find the proper job, given a job description in a CV, who is a matching person uh, for the job. How can you find the best one? Well, this is a, a funny application. You <laughs> He's laughing because it's his project, which we are doing. This is every cook. And it's a machine which can cook by itself, so it can cut the vegetables and it can uh, weigh the meat and it can combine and mix it and everything like that. And what we want to do is we want to take recipes from the internet, which are plain text, and we want to translate it into machine-readable format such that the machine can perform this recipe. And you only have to throw in some potatoes and some meat and it's done magic. Well, it's still a prototype, but this machine can already cut and weigh and do all this stuff. We still have to do this Great text. Risotto Sorry? Great risotto. Great risotto. He already ate it, so, and he's still alive. So, um, but not with our recipes. So, and, and then, well, this is unfortunately not our project, um, <laughs> but, but we are close to that. So, IBM Watson, you probably know this, uh, rather large computer which uh, IBM invented to combine all the entire world knowledge into one computer to win a TV show. So that's a good <laughs> research project, I think. But what I want to talk about is a very, very simple application, nothing like that, because this is difficult. I, I cannot understand that. So I want to talk about very simple stuff. So this is social media monitoring. What is the topic, um, you're given on the one hand side all these data which is available on the internet. <coughs> Tweets, forum, blog posts, news articles and stuff like that. And companies want to compress the information, analyze it, and they want to know what are people writing about my product. Is, is my product good or not? What is the hype on the internet? What are new topics? And from this entire application, one of the text analytics components is sentiment analysis. And the basic question is, are they going to write something positive or negative? So, if I take a post entry like this, Vice Analytics is a free Android app that I find very handy when it comes to troubleshooting and monitoring a home network. I would guess everybody agrees that this is positive. 
well, I can find examples which are negative and we want to detect these examples automatically because then I can go to my boss and say, oh, there are people writing positive about my project, so we are doing something good. Or if it is negative, we can go and, and try to improve our product. And the next 30 minutes or something like that will be about how can we do that and uh, how good is sentiment analysis in practice. So, if I talk about sentiment analysis in the future, it will always refer to take one sentence or a very short, short paragraph of text, like two or three sentences, one tweet, and um, we want to know the sentiment of this text passage. There are other flavors of sentiment detection, like you want to have an entire document, five pages, you want to know is it positive or negative, or a news article, is it positive about the political system, or you, are, you have something like target-specific sentiment, you want to know this product in this review, is it a positive or negative context? But then you, you need to know which product you are talking about or which entity you are talking about. Or you want to have something like rating prediction. Oh, I'm ready. Uh, okay, still there. Rating prediction, this is, you're given a product review on the internet, but you don't have these stars, and you want to know if the user would have given stars, would he have given you three stars, or five stars, or one star, or whatever. Um, because not every tool on the internet where you can give product reviews has this rating, but people still want to have, at the end, three stars or five stars. Well, they want to have five stars, of course. Okay, so, but I will talk about sentence-based sentiment analysis. And how can we do that? So, the most easy idea, and I will try to I'll bring you into the topic a little bit from scratch. Um, the most easiest idea is to just count positive and negative words. So, you just have a lexicon, a dictionary, and a list of positive words, good, love, nice, negative words, bad, hate, ugly, and you just count the words. Okay? Now this is what works pretty good, but uh, if you do it in practice, it works for very simple cases, like this is nice weather. Okay, fine. But for more complicated cases, and I will show a couple of examples, you still find, you immediately find that you need to improve your algorithm. So, let's look at this analysis is good, this analysis is excellent. If I don't want to know only that it is positive, I need to distinguish between these two, so I need to do it a little bit more fine-grained. I have to have a score which says good is a little bit positive, but excellent is better. Well, then I have this car is really very expensive. It's probably negative, and with these booster words, it's even more expen It's more negative than this car is expensive. So I need to have a lectionary which uh, is associated with these booster words, and I need to collect them. And then I have these combined sentences. Like, this car has an appealing design and comfortability, but it is expensive. So is this positive or negative? Who is for positive? Who is for negative? Okay, who is for I don't know and I don't know what I should say because it's neither positive or negative and it's not neutral, I mean. So we need to come up with something like a mixed category where we say, well, you can say even in one sentence something positive or negative and we cannot decide what is more. I mean, these are two positive words and one negative word, but in total, I, I cannot just sum it up and say it's class one. Uh, that would not be fair, I mean. So we need to have a mixed category. Fine. But then, <coughs> language is not that easy. So what about this analysis not good? Now it becomes interesting. <coughs> Negation in text is terrible. I would like to forbid it forever. But um, OK, so how do you solve it? Well, it's quite easy. You take the, 
the value of good, the, the score of good, and you just negate it, with, multiply it with minus 1, and you get a minus 3. Okay, so you can do that quite easily. But then, this car is appealing, and I do not find it expensive. Well, you cannot just multiply everything with minus 1, because this would just m invert the level of the, the value of appealing as well, so you cannot do that. Then you can say, okay, I do it. What did I do? I invert only scores after the, the appearance of negation. Okay, now it becomes boring because you know what comes next, huh? right? I do not find the car expensive and it is appealing. Oh, now I have to think. So, probably this is positive. So, at the end, it should be positive, and I didn't find any good rule how I could do that anymore. I mean, I have to invert something, but not everything, and so. In some case, we came to the conclusion we need to understand the sentence in a way. And understanding, well, this is kind of linguistic analysis, so we need to computer linguists and linguists, and we no need to know the structure of sentences in, in reality. So, this is pretty complex, so let me explain it. Uh, I have a sentence here, and for every part of the sentence, I just annotate with some tool which does it automatically which kind of um, sentence structure, sentence um, component it is, and then I have this verb phrase which is interesting, which goes from do not find the car expensive, and then I have another noun and verb phrase, it is appealing. And now I have the structure of the sentence, and now I can do my inversion of the score. So I can say, okay, I invert that phrase because it is ne negated, and this is not negated, and then I get this plus five for positive because it's correct. Now, doing that by hand, I, I couldn't do it because I'm not a linguist. I, I wouldn't expect that everybody here could do that because uh, school is a long time ago and you probably don't remember all these phrases sometimes. Um, but even for computers, it's very hard to do that because they need to have a full grammar of the language, of the target language. And uh, we tried it and people try it, but it's very, very hard to get it work properly. So, and basically this is not machine learning. So this is boring for us, especially for you. So I, I listed some tools. If you want to do that with linguistic analysis, sentiment analysis, then you can look here some typical tools which you can use for that because many parts are already solved in a way, but you still need to plug it together and get it running. But this is something like rule-based or linguistic analysis-based sentiment analysis. What I want to talk about is the second part, and that is corpus-based sentiment analysis. So, I did this talk already some weeks ago, and there I had to explain what corpus-based sentiment analysis might be. I hope everybody here knows what the idea is, so I can skip most of this part. We, we have this training set, and we have a machine learning algorithm, whatever it is, and we have this document which needs to be classified, and I predict the label, positive, negative, mixed, or neutral. So, whatever this machine learning algorithm is, I don't care at the moment. What I care at, well, okay, I need a corpus, and two years ago, there was no really good corpus available for sentiment analysis. So, it's still a very recent field where people are working on, and uh, the first really good corpus was developed 2013 with about, uh, let me think, 30,000, no, 13,000 um, tweets. So basically now you can do this corpus analysis. Before, people had some small corpora with 500, 600 sentences at most. Well, and then you take this corpus and uh, you throw in a lot of features. I, I just wrote down, for example, some features for tweets, so you take word engrams, which is basically the, the combination of small sequences of words, one to four words typically. You, you take a POS tagger, which is a part of speech, which comes from the linguistic analysis, but there are tools which do this still very good. 
And then you take a sentiment lexicon, which, like I showed before, for every word you have this tonality and you can just plug it in. And then you have something like negation. You take just a list of words which typically negate the context. You can, well, this is for tweets, so you have these exclamation marks and question marks at the end of tweets. You probably know this. This tweet has only somehow four words and then it has a long line of exclamation marks behind to say that it is important. Uh, you have these emoticons, you have these hashtags, you have words which are elongated to stress that they are important. Well, and then you can add some more features. So Martin is currently uh, building up some other features as well because he's working in this area as well. Um, and then you throw these features all into your um, machine learning algorithm and you get some results. And the question is now, how good is it? I mean, how good are current sentiment analysis tools? And this question is very important because if you want to plug it into a tool, for example, for social media monitoring, then you want to have good results. So you need to have a good estimate how good these tools are. So we said we want to do a small study and evaluate how good are commercial sentiment analysis tools which you can buy. Okay, so we took seven public text corpora and it was some tweets, some news headlines, some uh, product reviews, a speech transcript, and then we took nine commercial APIs which were basically made for sentiment analysis. They were standalone, they had an API, and they get, gave us free access because we couldn't pay for them. And we had three categories, positive, negative, and other, and we just threw in all these examples from the corpora and asked the tools, what is the result? So what do you guess? How good can you do sentiment analysis? You are given a sentence, about 100 characters, 20 words, and on average, how good can you be? What is the average accuracy that you expect? Going back to the talk before, I mean, image detection and detecting how interesting an image is, you said you can achieve 72%. Okay. Sentiment analysis. Who thinks it's below 50% accuracy for sentiments? Okay. Just to give you a baseline, a random algorithm because I have three categories here, would be 33% because it's just random. So below 50, 50 to 60, 1, 2, 3, 60 to 70, majority 70 to 80, okay, optimistic 80 to 90, okay, 90 to 100, nobody, okay. So let's see. Uh, these are the tools that we took. Um, some are pretty big tools. Uh, they make a lot of money. Actually, they have millions of users. One of them, we are in contact with, they, they analyze about one billion texts per day. So this is really... Mm -hmm. Okay. So, those who said something about above 80, no chance. The average of all tools is somewhere at 60%. The best tool per corpus, that means for one corpus, for one type of text, it's always you're showing the best tool and the worst tool. Well, they even perform worse than the baseline of 33% in some cases. That's very hard to do. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but they sell. I mean, we, we don't say which tool it is, so, okay. Um, but even the best tools, well, on average, it's something, somewhere at 60%. And that's always the best tool per corpus. So for each corpus, it might be a different tool. Uh, do I have? Yes. And this is the overall best tool. This is an outlier here in a way because these are tweets and everybody thinks we need to do good on tweets, so they do a lot of tweet on tweets, but for the rest of, top of, word, well, of text, it's about 60%. Now, 
Now think about it. That means four out of ten documents are wrong. And then I do my business decision on which product is good and or bad uh, on this data. Okay. So summary. It's not done yet, but summary of this study. <laughs> yeah, we agreed. So we talked to one of these CEOs and we presented the data and he said, well, they all suck, but we suck too. And we want to do better, so tell us how. And we said, okay, we don't know. Maybe we look at scientific tools, so academia must do better. I mean, they always claim they do, well, here, best research in the world. And so what about academia? There's a contest running since last year and this year again. It's called Semival, and it's a competition on semantic analysis. And there are two tasks on Twitter analysis. Um, one is contextual polarity, which I will not talk about because it's only a small part of a sentence where you have to say whether it's positive or negative. And one is message polarity. So is a tweet positive or negative? And this is a scientific contest. So the best universities in the world, the best teams in the world participate. They took 15,000 tweets, they annotated it with a mechanical chart, they provided training data, it was about 11,000 tweets, I think, and then the test data was 4,000 tweets. Last year, competition, here are the results. 36 teams submitted, and the average F1 score, which is basically, you can say it's accuracy, so which is correct or not. It's 54 percent. Okay, but maybe there is a lot of teams which score very bad. So, hopefully, only nine teams above 50 percent. Okay, um, mm -hmm. and the best team was 69 percent. Best academic team in the world which participated in analyzing tweets, and these tweets were not really tweets from real world because they did some filtering, they threw out all trash tweets, they um, threw out tweets which were not uniquely labeled by the uh, Mechanical Turk workers and so it was already a good quality corpus and still 69% for comparison. The best commercial tool would have had 62% without being trained on the data. So a general purpose commercial tool, 62%. And if I remember the data correct, it's one team with 69%, one team with 65%, and the rest is below 60. Wow. A um, lot of work to do. So, but still we had the CEO who said, you, we want to do better, so don't look at academia because uh, they cannot do better. So this year, the task is run again, exactly the same task, because they said, well, we don't think that this is a, such a good result, so hopefully uh, we will come up with better results. And uh, Martin is going to program an SVM, which is trying to compete with them. And submission is on Sunday, so everybody who is in the room and who thinks he can do better, uh, training data I will provide, and you can just try. Two days. Okay. But still, how can we do better? Um, so we thought, what about meta classification? Can we bring together a lot of these tools and then make them give a better result? Sounds reasonable, isn't it? You have a lot of tools. We had nine tools, mediocre results, but you bring them together and say, oh, we do a voting, majority wins. Hmm? Doesn't work? Great. Good prediction. Okay. This is again the slide from before. The best tool per corpus, worst tool per corpus. And this is a majority classifier. Well, doesn't win is not really quite correct. It's still close to the best result. Doesn't improve no, it doesn't improve significantly. But 
it has one advantage. I don't need to pick the best tool per corpus based on the doc type, but I can pick just my, meta, my um, majority classifier and it still works as good as the best tool almost. But still, I mean this is still 60%, 4 out of 10. So, okay, maybe we have to do something better. So what we did was a random forest approach. Um, basically we threw in all these annotations of the tools into a random forest classifier and used it to predict the unknown data. Okay, same slide as before. This is a majority classifier, best tool. And now this brings a little bit, but still, okay. So the, let me say what you see here. The random forest classifier for every corpus is better than each single tool on this corpus. And here we have a gap of, I think it's 9%, so it's really a good improvement. But still, well, this is 68%, I think, and, and the rest is slightly above 60%. Okay, we didn't come up with any better idea yet, so this is where our talk ends. <laughs> if you have a better idea, um, you're kindly invited to try it out. Um, we will submit this random cl forest classifier with the commercial tools and some scientific tools which participate to the SEMIVAL event, and hopefully we will be at least close to, to the winner, which is 69%. We don't know yet. You had a question? Or? When you tested your initial approach, the, very, the one from the very beginning, did you just count the words? Um, on this, no, we didn't, no. <laughs> no, but it will be terribly wrong, so, yeah. And how about taking the C3, the one which is worse than random, and then inverting the output? <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that, okay. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. That's embarrassing. Um, <coughs> so let me finish and go out of the door. Okay, so um, where am I? So the question is, why is it that difficult? I mean, you, you came up with 72%. We cannot beat that. Well, we can beat it on Twitter, but not in any arbitrary text purpose. And the reason is, it's not so easy. I mean, well, taking the bag of words approach and just counting positive and negative doesn't work, obviously. But why is it difficult? So, let me give you some examples. Salaries for software engineers are extremely high. Who thinks this is positive? <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks this is negative? Who is the CEO of a company who works in Zurich and has to employ software engineers and thinks this is positive? I'm a product manager and it's negative. Yeah, right. So sentiment is context dependent. Depending on what kind of job you have, you will rate this different. Okay. What a great car. It stopped working on the second day. Who thinks this is positive? <laughs> and who thinks his algorithm could detect that this is irony and say that it is negative? Watson can. Watson can. Wow. I, I, I'm not sure. They pretend. Hmm? No. They, they pretend to, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I cannot even read it, but. You can date me if you still sag your pants super hard. That shit is played the fuck out. <laughs> Whoever can tell me what that means <laughs> will earn a coffee. <laughs> I mean, ugh. this is Twitter language. It took me one minute to find such an example in our training data. And I cannot tell my algorithm what he should say for this because I, I don't know. Maybe the Americans might know that what, but still. Language on Twitter is not a language. Okay. And then, 
Yeah, then I only talked about English. But what about Greek or German or Swiss German or whatever? If you want to do sentiment detection in these languages, you can throw away all your knowledge about English languages and do it from scratch. And this is still hard. So there's a lot of open challenges. And um, yeah, I, I think this is what we are trying to tackle in the next hopefully couple of years and uh, try to solve at least some of them. So, talk in short, let me summarize. And now it's really a summary, afterwards it's over. So, first, sentiment analysis is a challenge and it's an interesting challenge because people want to buy it. I mean, you can sell sentiment analysis and earn money and you can earn lots of money if it is good. The CEO I talked about said, well, we know we are about 60%. If we could reach 70% on every text corpus, we would be the heroes worldwide and we would sell it for every price because nobody can do that. Well, we cannot do it either. So, next time. Commercial tools classify six out of 10 dogs wrong. I had this image and I didn't know if I would like to put it on poor because I still want to work with these commercial tool providers, but um, Okay, so it's at most average. Well, basically, academic systems cannot do better. So nobody can do sentiment analysis at the moment. Well, and then random forest outperform of at least the best tools. So hopefully there is a way to bring all together all these information from the different tools because the random forest can do it. He can improve the performance so it should be possible to put it into one tool and do it. I mean, the practical approach to buy all these tool providers and then sell it is it's very expensive, but uh, it shows that there is potential to improve these tools. And this concludes my talk, three minutes before time limit. So there's still some time for questions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the lack of training data. Why don't you just take the reviews? Like from Amazon, there's probably hundreds of millions of reviews which have the rating, like one to five star. And yeah, like yeah we, we follow this approach. Um, my, my colleague Fatih Usdili, who is doing a lot of this work, um, has the same idea. And um, I'm very skeptical because th this correlation between a review has five stars and a review contains positive statements is not always true. There are people who claim that it is true and who do a, little, a lot of work, of it, but it's still an assumption. There is no proof for that yet. So um, I can write something like, well, this car is slow, this car, I, I don't like the color, I, I don't like, but at all, overall, I, I think it's good. And then I give five stars and it, I only have a list of negative statements. So there are, is a lot of um, examples where it doesn't really correlate. So, this is not a good training set, at least until we know that it is really um, good correlated. Yeah. Are you going to take, for example, the hotels with a small hotels with a small number of extremely positive reviews that are typically fake, like uh, yeah. written by the hotel itself, and then you will have a good positive exam? Ah, that is okay. That might be an approach. Yeah. Yeah. That takes this one. Yeah. You mentioned that Twitter has weird language, but still. I think because everybody wants to do Twitter, so they probably uh, uh, tweaked their tool and looked how good it is on Twitter. And um, there is, for, for Twitter, there are some test corpora as well, and it's a very closed um, domain. So you can just download all these tweets and you can an annotate them by hand. The other corpora that we had, probably they were not available to the tool providers. So it didn't, I, I don't even know whether they trained or whether they did some linguistic approach. But um, we took some news headlines and we took some quotes from speeches, which probably they didn't have. So it's really a, another domain. But everybody does Twitter. And this is probably the reason why everybody is good on Twitter. Yeah. It's very inter easy to get hands on the data. There was a question? Yeah, I've, I've seen more comments on the 
Nurse uh, Quest Week, um, uh, we surveyed some with an open question and 40 or 50 rated questions. And you find that the people with the most positive responses often have the most critical comments. Mm -hmm. And our perception is it because they care most about what they're rating. Yeah. Um, and therefore, they, we were always surprised to think that negative comments were very positive. Yeah. But, but I think it's, it's, I mean, you don't write very often positive stuff for, for something like an event here. If you are asked at the moment, at the end, what is, are your comments? And, well, you write down, well, I didn't like if, that there is only two bottles of uh, iced tea and I don't like that the speaker had red shoes or whatever. But then you do the star rating and you say, well, but it was great. So this is... Uh, there was another question? Uh, yes, uh, have you looked at, so you said the labels were provided by Amazon first. Yeah. Do you know how much did people agree on a label? So maybe there's an optical baseline that you can... Yes, um, so um, for the Samival corpus it was five people who did the annotations and um, they took those as far as I remember were at least three agreed on the label and the other ones were not too far away so it was not a jump from positive to negative so to say. Um, what we did for our evaluation we took we had also labeled with uh, annotators individuals and we took only those where all annotators agreed so it was really a perfect match or we threw them out of the evaluation. Um, there are, p I, I know at least one paper who evaluated that and um, he evaluated the labeling of individual words and came up with 80, 80, let me, 84 something, 85, 84 percent where the annotators really agree. And for other words which have a sentiment they don't agree on the, on, on the tonality. So there is an upper limit, I would say about 85 percent, this is what you can reach. Um, in our paper, what, which we wrote, we, we evaluate also if all tools agreed on the sentiment and the annotation was different, there's something strange. And we looked at some examples and found out that the annotation was really wrong. So, and for one corpus it was about 15% where we think the annotation might be wrong, but, but we didn't evaluate it in the end. So we just looked at single examples and said, well, yeah, we agree with the tools and not with the annotation. But still, this is American English in the tweets, and uh, it's very hard for us, for German natives, to decide whether it is really true or false. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't seem like such a great result, and yet these companies presumably make money, so there must be an application to which that level of <coughs> is sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, could you share your knowledge yeah. um, you have on like, where this would be used? Yeah, I mean, um, it depends on, on what you aim at. If you aim at precision or if you aim at uh, recall, it's very different. So if you want to just have an estimate over time, for your company and your competitor who is more positive. Then you don't have to have 85% because, well, you just count and there is some, some bias, but uh, it's still okay. But if you want to pick the positive statements and show it to the user or show it to your CEO and say, these are the positive statements which our tool found, well, you need to have really positive statements. So it depends really on the application that you have. But uh, especially for the case of social media monitoring, it's very often sufficient to have 60%. And I mean, you cannot do better. I mean, you can say it's, it's terrible, but you don't have anything else. You can do it by hand. But uh, yeah. And then, well, these are commercial companies, mostly situated in the US, and they don't say we have 60%. I mean, they will say, well, we have d done an evaluation and we come up with 86%, whatever the score is. And probably they have data where this is true. 
but uh, we, 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 we found something different. I mean, we found scientific papers, and this is, if you read our paper, you will see that, that we wrote scientific sentiment analysis claims to be above 80%. We have several papers where they say, we solved the problem, sentiment analysis, our algorithm reaches 88%. And if you look at it in detail, they took one training set and trained their algorithm on this training set and they took mostly the same sentences and evaluated on this domain. Yes, and they reached 88%. So if they took, let, let's give a stupid example, positive and negative sentences from five, no, no, seven year old children they probably reach 88% or more because they are very simple. But if you want to have sentence analysis on any kind of document, no. There was one more example. Okay. Okay. Okay.